Okay, welcome to chapter two, and we're going to do this in the order of um, cognition, language, and intelligence. So, how this relates in psychology is cognition is equated to thinking. So, when you hear the term psych uh, um, cognition, think in terms of thinking. And so, we're going to look at what that process is like in terms of how we use our brain to do thinking. And then we're going to look at language, just briefly, but how we develop our language, and how does language enable us to sort of communicate what we're thinking about. And then lastly, when we think about thinking and use of language, then it seems to be a natural transition to sort of wonder, well, how do we know when people are smart or intelligent or not, or how do we vary that and understand those variations? And we're going to look at all of those things in this particular chapter. So. What you might want to keep in mind is the previous chapter on biology and looking at those neuron firings and how all of that body components contribute to cognition and what's going on neurologically and trans neurotransmitters. Language, again, that relationship to biology and intelligence, which is a more of a measurement of how well we're and how, efficiency, how efficient we are in the use of our brain. So good luck in this chapter. Okay, looking at cognition, we have ourselves a definition here where basically it's the mental process. You can shorten it up in saying thinking, where we acquire, store, and retrieve the information that we're using. And this includes all sorts of sensations, all your senses, you know, hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling, tasting, and perception. So that's how we take the sensation information in in our brain perceives it and gives us information about what we just experienced. But we also look at imagery, concept formation, reasoning, decision making, problem solving, and language. So it's a very complex issue, this con cognition, and we're going to look at some of these concepts. When we look at reasoning, it's a form of thinking where conclusions are drawn from a set of facts. So if you're thinking critically and you're being a critical thinker, then you are using your reasoning skills where you're drawing on facts to draw conclusions and come up with reasons. Now, there's reasoning by deduction and there's reasoning by induction. Whereas if you're reasoning by deduction, you're reasoning from a general, from a general perspective down to specific. So you're going from big to small. You narrowed it down. That's deduction. You're drawing particular conclusions from general principles. Whereas if you're reasoning from induction, your general conclusions are drawn from particular facts. So you've actually gone in the other direction. You've taken the small details and have gone up to the bigger general concept. So induction starts small and works big. Deduction starts big and works small. Now, we may use different reasoning strategies for different issues. You might sometimes be deductive reasoning and other times inductive reasoning. We may use one more than the other, but we have both available in terms of our cognition. And imagery, which is another important element about cognition, because much of what we do is about creating images, representations in the mind about sensory experience. We receive visual information. We receive auditory, gustatory. Now, gustatory is often used to be representative of taste and speech. Um, motor, uh, olfactory. Now, olfactory is about smelling and breathing and tactile or touch. And it's useful in learning or maintaining many motor skills by using all of our visual imagery. Now, we're going to focus just on two major tools um, in cognition, and that is imagery, which is what we just mentioned here. So when we're using imagery, um, we use these images that we make in our mind, both of you know examples that we see in the world around us, as well as if I'm thinking about a concept in biology, oftentimes I'm making an image in my mind of that. If I'm thinking about the blood system, I'm thinking about the respiratory system, the skeletal system, I'm imagining bones and the connections between one bone to the next. And so this is um, 
using our mental category to use to represent class or groups of objects and people. And so I would look at bones and separating bones from blood vessels because bones are solid calcium-based um, structures that support the body. And so I've categorized them differently than I would categorize blood vessels, which are much more flexible, thinner, and uh, transporting blood through the, through the body. And so we use our mental categories, including the imagery, to classify groups of objects, people, organizations, events, uh, situations, or even the relations that we share um, in common characteristics or attributes. So for example, I have a mental image when I say the word furniture about all the things that I would count as furniture. And it might be different than the list that you would make about what for you is furniture. You know, there might be a certain uh, piece of furniture that I may not, you know, I may treat as furniture, but you may not see it as furniture at all. Um, colleges, we categorize them. When you made your selection to come to Georgian, you used your collection of how you define what is a good college to help decide about which college to come to. Concepts, on the other hand, these help us in order, in, in help us order the world and to think and to communicate with speed and efficiency. So concepts are these labels that we would use um, to represent these groups. So when we were children, we started to learn about cats, dogs, horses, and cows. We were making these concepts about what separates a cow from a cat, from a horse, from a dog. We would use our imagery to see pictures of what these animals look like and the concept about what makes up a dog compared to a horse, well, one might be size. One might also be the noise they make or the speed in which they travel and whether they have hooves or not. These are the things that start to separate one category or one concept of animal to another concept. And I attribute certain characteristics to a dog that I wouldn't necessarily put to a horse. And so we use these as ways of organizing our thinking to make good sense of the world around us so we can navigate it, communicate about it, and make our way through the world that we call, or the world that we experience. Now when we think in terms of concepts, we can think in terms of prototypes. Now prototypes are examples. Um, usually they fit closely with natural concepts. For example here, and I've got an example here, if you uh, are trying to find what is for you a bird prototype, it might be a robin or a sparrow, as on the left-hand side, since they can fly rather than penguins or emus, which don't fly. Which of these birds best fit a prototype for the concept of bird? Well, it kind of depends on some of your experiences. You could do this with cars. You know, what's your prototype for a car? An example that embodies the most common and typical features of the concept. Well, chances it's going to have four wheels. Chances are it has a roof. Chances are it has a motor. Chances, you know, th these are uh, what we would say in terms of a concept of helping us to distinguish cars from trucks, from bicycles, from motorcycles. And so prototypes are these examples which embody it. Now, if you think about it in terms of um, this penguin, we're moving to the second one. We have prototypes. So we move to exemplars. Now, exemplars are individual instances. An example, when we talk about bird, that for us is in our stored memory and our personal experience about what is a bird. Now, if, for example, uh, I worked at a, uh, a penguin zoo, I might see penguins frequently, and for me, my exemplar for a bird would be a penguin. But I don't work at a zoo, so for me, my exemplar for a bird would be one that flies like a robin. And so the individual instances that we have, our exemplars could be different. Our prototypes are probably similar, but our exemplars could be different based on personal experiences. So people decide on whether the item reflects a concept by comparing it with the most typical item. So for um, cars, if you saw a three-wheel car, you might not see it as a car because it has three wheels. or you might not know for sure how you stand on SUVs. Are they cars or are they trucks? And so it would be based on your personal experience and you know what you have used as an exemplar for yourself. Now, 
We use our cognition for a variety of purposes, not just to organize our world and sort of discern the different aspects and categories of things in our world. We also use it in our decision making. And decision making, it's a process of considering alternatives and then choosing what would work best given the circumstances, which is the best alternative. And it's not always easy to do, but we have some strategies, we have some ways in which we use our brain to do that. The first would be called systematic decision making. And on the bottom right hand corner, you see an image of a circular process. You have uh, a problem. A new problem, sorry, and then you have a so you have a problem. You have information that you gain. You make a decision. You see what the action from that decision is. You evaluate and monitor how you're doing with that action, and you continue that process. That's systematic. That steps. Systematic really sort of means a process of considering alternatives and then choosing from one of those alternatives. And so because it's systematic decision making. We use our brain to evaluate ver a variety of alternatives to solve our problem. Now, there are at times where we'll use bounded rea rationality. This is where we, pr we have <laughs> boundaries or limitations around the decision-making process that prevents us from being entirely logical. Um, boundless r rationality is can be a, 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 a disadvantage in thinking, and sometimes it can be an advantage. To decide within boundaries is to sometimes put yourself in a position to try to resolve the problem within the limitations that exist for you. And so this could be a strength in some cases. And then an, an alternative way is to use the, a process called elimination by aspects, a decision-making approach in which um, alternatives are evaluated against criteria. You made a choice about a college. You had some criteria of what you would expect and what you needed to get from that college experience. It might have been that you live nearby and you could save money to live at home. It might have been that uh, you had um, looked at the program compared to other programs that you're in and you felt that this best met your needs. Um, and you rank order, you rank the, um, the criteria based on what's most important to you using rank uh, for, the, um, for the most important and to the least important. And you use this as a way of eliminating alternatives. And so this is all part of the cognition process of us deciding, you know, what is the best approach. Now, not all problems can be, be done so systematically. And so we use other decision-making models. And we use a variety of them. And what I'm going to do here is just show you a variety of them. And I'll put them all up here. And I'm going to walk you through each one. Heuristics are um, rules of thumb uh, that is derived from the from from our experience. If if um, um, it's been my experience over and over and over again that when this kind of problem arises, this is how I deal with it. I'm relying on a heuristic, um, even though there is no guarantee that it's going to work or it's useful, it's what I'm used to doing, and so I rely on it. A decision to leave home early to avoid getting stuck in traffic, um, though you don't know there will be any traffic, is an example of a heuristic. Now, a lot of times, too, what we'll use as a heuristic is we use them in crossword puzzles, sudokus, or approaching school tasks, tests and assignments. What you'll do is you'll do what you've always done because you've always done it. It doesn't always mean it's going to work, but it's what you do. It's your strategy. It's called a heuristic. Now, availability heuristic is a cognitive rule of thumb that says that if the prob probability of an event or the importance of an assignment assigned to it is based on the availability in memory. That is to say that a decision to leave home early to avoid traffic came because you were stuck in one recently. It was the most recent example that you can recall. Just yesterday I was in traffic, so today I'm going to leave early to avoid traffic. It's the availability of that solution strategy that I used as to why I may use it again. You know, when you think about choosing a fast food restaurant, chances are you use a representative um, heuristic. That is to say that a prototype that guides your expectations about, well, how long will it take to get my food? What will it taste like? 
restaurant chains, they use the same ingredients and the same methods at their locations to help establish customers' represented heuristic fast food buying st strategies. So you go to Tim Hortons because you can depend on getting Tim Hortons in the same way, the same cup, cup, cup of coffee done in the same manner. You go to a fast food restaurant because it's consistent. And that's what's called a representative heuristic is that it's representative of what it is you want for a fast food. And the industry knows that, and that's why they are consistent, is that they want you, they want to feed into what is your automatic response, your automatic decision-making process. Now, recognition uh, heuristic is a strategy in which decision-making stops as soon as a factor that moves one toward a decision has been recognized. You vote for a woman candidate simply because she's a female, um, on your ballot when it comes to voting and you want a woman to win the election and so that would be considered a recognition heuristic you've had a strategy you've had a condition and you've had it met so you select it that's the you recognized it so you select it now these heuristics aren't always good decision-making examples they're based on habits in some cases but they're not always useful and and the best strategy but these are the ways that we do um, make decisions a lot of the time. Framing, it's the way information is presented so that um, so as to emphasize either a potential gain or a loss as the outcome. So positive framing leads people to prefer an option. Describing a cure as saving 300 people will cause it to be favored over one that lists how many will die. And so the framing of it is to sort of say the perspective you take on a particular problem. Some people view a problem as a challenge. That's their framing. Others see it as a, as a failure, and that's their framing. So how we frame a decision can make a huge difference on how well we can solve it. Uh, intuition is another strategy we use for our decision making, and it, it can be useful, and it can be very good. It's rapidly formed judgments based on gut feelings or instincts. Uh, usually they're based on mental representations um, that we get body information, like a gut feeling, rather than any factual details. Now this can lead to errors in reasoning about different decisions. Physicians overestimate the degree in which condoms reduce the risk of sexually transmitted diseases. It's intuition for us to think that they may work, if we're not using them reliably, they're not as effective. The intuition component is there's no facts to support it necessarily. It's a gut feeling. And so it can have its strengths in that sometimes our gut feelings are fairly accurate, but it can be not very reliable at times because, well, there's not any facts behind it necessarily. And anchoring is the overestimating of the importance of a factor by focusing on the exclusion of other relevant factors. You get stuck on something. Focusing on the minimum credit card balance leads to higher interest rate charges, for example. So these are examples of decision-making strategies that we use that aren't always effective. Now, it leads us to wonder, well, what kinds of impediments to problem solving is there? Now, what you're seeing here is an image of what looks like, and it is, a power drill with a pair of scissors stuck in the end where the end is being used as a beater. Now, that's somebody who's not suffering from functional fixedness. When we get stuck with functional fixedness, we don't see different uses for familiar objects. You know, a cup is a cup is a cup. But if I broke the craft of my coffee maker, um, I would say, well, I guess I can't use my coffee maker. But if I grabbed a pot and put it underneath and use my pot as a carafe, then I've got an alternative and I'm not stuck. But functional fixedness is getting stuck seeing familiar things in only one way, and we don't find ways to use them in sort of uh, um, unique ways. And so one of the impediments is just not being very creative, I guess. Um, being stuck in seeing things in only one way and not getting past seeing them that way. Um, mental sets, these are types of fixations that um, we try to solve problems in a particular way that has worked in the past and we get stuck using the same strategies without really getting the kinds of results we'd expect. So for example, um, 
my dad is a good example of this. He's having a he has a mental set about bills, bills that you receive for payment. He gets the statement. He goes, sits down at a desk. He writes the check. He puts a stamp in it, uh, puts it in an envelope, and puts a stamp on it, and puts it in the mail. Now, he has a mental set that he feels best that that's how you pay bills. He doesn't do them online. He doesn't have an alternative way that he feels comfortable doing it. He has a mental set that this is the best way to do it. If we don't update our mental sets, then at times um, we find ourselves um, doing the same things but not really getting the desired outcome in a timely manner. Now all of this does require a certain amount of language for us to sort out our problems, to make sense of the issues that we're trying to solve. So we're going to touch base just briefly on language and then we'll finish up this particular segment. When we think about language we have a quick little definition. Language is our means of communicating. Uh, we communicate our thoughts through the use of language, our feelings through the use of language, and we use this system uh, to share socially all the, all the sort of things we need to know about the world around us, these symbols that we have in the world around us, the sounds um, and, and written symbols that we have around us. We put a language to it. We can speak language, we can write language, and it arranged in a, and, and it follows rules, rules of grammar. So when we think about uh, language, there's a structure for language and it's called psycholinguistics. This is the study of how language is acquired, how language is produced, and how it's used and how the sounds and symbols of language are translated into meaning. Now you've probably had the experience where you've heard one word have more than one meaning or that the meaning of words can change over time. And so this is what psycholinguistic study is just how that happens and what is the reasons for it and what are the implications or what are the features that contribute to those changes. Now the smallest unit of sound in the spoken language are called phenomes and then the smallest units of meaning in language are called morpho morph <laughs> morphemes. So morphemes meaning spoken smallest spoken language or phenomes F phonemes I'm sorry so those are the like incremental units we develop we, we make more sounds and string sounds together to create words sentences and paragraphs all of which which express meaning and the smallest units of meaning in language are morphemes now syntax is the aspects of grammar that specifies the rules for arranging and combining words to form phrases and sentences. It's syntax that we spend a lot of our public school years learning in terms of language. is the basic grammatical structure of our language to make meaningful sense of the world around us and to be able to communicate effectively. And then semantics is the um, the meaning or the study of meaning derived from uh, morphemes in words and sentences. So this would be the intonations. F uh, semantics would be the sort of different pieces of language that, that create different meanings. Pragmatics would be the patterns of intonations and social roles associated with language. At the end of a sentence, we have a tendency to finish it at the end as if we're asking a question. We raise our voice up at the end. That's sort of leaving it as a question, whereas if we say instead, um, how are you doing? My voice tone goes down. That's more of a statement as opposed to a question. Even though it's still a question in it, a downward tone at the end of a sentence tends to create a statement as opposed to an upward tone at the end, which tends to create a question. And all of this contributes to our ability to express meaning to one another. Um, not always do we communicate effectively, but we all have language as a foundation. It's learning over time how to use our language to communicate more effectively. Now in terms of language development, we don't come into the world with language right off the get-go. We start with cooing and babbling. Now from the time we start crying as an infant to the time we're 17 years old, we move from crying as our only sound to 80,000 words as a 17-year-old. 
cooing and babbling, this is something that occurs in the first two to three months where you basically get, get vowel sounds, oohs and ahs. Six months, you know, at, by six months they're babbling, which is adding consonants to these vowels. Maybe you get ma, 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 or da, 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 or ba, ba, ba. At eight months, they're focusing on rhythm and intonation of language. And this increases the focus on sounds of their native language. So by eight to nine months, their ability to learn any language starts to reduce dramatically because now they're starting to focus in on the particular sounds that are being made by their native language, which is the parent's language. And by focusing on that, they're excluding other sounds. So this combination of vowels and consonants become very important in this very early stage of a learning continued, uh, continuing learning your native language. Now the second stage is that of the one word stage. And this is happening in that first two years where the use of um, words to communicate are single words. And they're using these single words as if they're whole sentences. So they might say milk. And what they might be meaning is, I want milk, where's the milk, give me milk now. <laughs> but they'll use one word, and it's treated as if it's a sentence. Now, between 18 and 20 months, they, be they begin, have, they'll have as much as 50 words, verbs, nouns, and adjectives, and they'll be stringing them together in twos. And this is the two-word stage of the telegraphic speech. By year two, they'll have somewhere in the neighborhood of 270 words. And then the suffixes, function words, and grammatical rules, these are things that we learn through school, and they gradually um, expose children to begin to add modifiers and increase the precision of their language. And it takes years. You're still learning language, and you're in, 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 your, in college, and you're learning languages for specific strategy, or for, for specific career choices, and learning how to communicate effectively in that manner as well. And lastly, in language, there are theories of how we acquire language. And we're going to look at just three of them. Learning theory, like learning theory was in Psychology 1, it's about uh, imitation and reinforcement. And so learning theorists say that language is gained in the way that other behaviors are learned. Um, we reinforce the words that we hear our children say. Hey, that's good. You, you know, that's good saying that or good using your words. Uh, we correct. They mimic us, they listen to the words that we say, and they repeat them. We praise them for using words appropriately, we give them attention when they're using their words, and we show them approval. Um, you'll notice in your textbook some of the weaknesses associated with learning theory that's in the text. Now, the, um, the nativist um, position, this is put out by Norm Chomsky, and in his theory of where language comes from, he sees it as being innate. Innate means that it's something that's born in you. Um, you don't learn it, it's already there. The capacity to learn is already there. He suggests there's what's called an LAD, a learning activation device. Now, it's not like there's a, you know, a transistor embedded in our brain, but there's a functional part of the brain whose responsibility is language acquisition. And if there isn't any evidence for it yet, but that doesn't mean, theoretically, it's not there. You know, in the brain that enables children to acquire language and grammar more easily and naturally. And he says that it sort of de it develops in stages. Now, again, you can read up a little bit more about that in your text, but you can also sort of, uh, you can go and check out Norm Chomsky's work in this area. The uh, interac interactionalist perspective uses kind of a bit of both in terms of we're born with and acquire uh, language, but it's done at a concrete level, and then we build on that based on the environment that we're growing up in. The interactionalist base their theory, if you will, on the interaction between uh, the adults and the children and the exposure to language that children have with the people around them. Okay, so that's the first part of Chapter 2. And what we'll do in the second part is look at intelligence. All right, thank you very much.